Yep, thank you for um, everyone who's joined so far. Um, my name is Simon Clark. I'm the EGU's Community Programs Coordinator. Uh, today is World Conservation Day, which is the perfect opportunity to discuss ocean conservation. So welcome to the webinar on said topic. Uh, if you have a question, please enter it by clicking on the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen at any time during the webinar. Uh, where you can also upvote questions and questions with the most votes are more likely to be asked. Uh, note, we will try and get through all questions um, either way anyway. Um, the webinar will also be recorded and uploaded to our YouTube channel, which is at Eurogeosciences. And today I'll be talking to our guest expert, Dr. Rebecca Helm. Um, yeah, so where should we begin? Um, could you give me more background on your personal so it's background and expertise. Uh, tell us a little bit of who you are and what your expertise is in. Of course, my name is Rebecca Helm. I'm um, joining from Western North Carolina, where I'm an assistant professor of biology at the University of North Carolina, Asheville. Um, my background is in open ocean life. So I study jellyfish and organisms that live on the ocean surface. It's been a heck of a year for doing science on the high seas. Uh, we haven't been out much, but uh, it's been really amazing to come together with uh, broader communities over the past year to try to tackle some of the questions that we have and some of the challenges that the high seas and the open ocean ecosystems are facing. So it's really great to be here. Thank you so much again for having me. Sure. Um, so you mentioned you're a physical marine biologist but you also work in marine conservation. Um, how did you become involved from being a marine researcher into conservation efforts? I have been studying all these organisms that live on the high seas. And spoiler alert is that we know virtually nothing about them. So uh, of course, every field of science could say that about something. Um, but in this case, we really don't even know what species are out there, if a species in the Atlantic is the same species that's in the Pacific, what their life histories look like, how long they live, how often they reproduce, what they eat. Um, it's, it's almost sort of going back to uh, 19th century science in terms of just finding and describing organisms. And so in the process of doing that, being involved in that very fun and exciting science, I sort of realized wow, you know, we're learning a lot about these ecosystems. Some of the ecosystems in the open ocean appear to be potentially very fragile, especially when we start thinking about deeper sea life, how slow they move. We can sort of interpret based on some aspects of their biology, how long they might live. And some of them may live for a very, very long time. What mechanisms are in place at the level of policy to maybe conserve or protect these ecosystems? If there was an organization or a company that wanted to go in and fish or mine um, or harvest plastic resources or things like that. And in sort of asking that question and then contacting experts, I realized that there are very few. And a lot of potential opportunities are being discussed at the United Nations right now um, through a set of negotiations for a potential treaty called Biodiversity in Areas Beyond National Jurisdiction. And so that was what really kind of um, popped a light bulb over my head. Wow, there are all these biologists. They're working so hard to try to understand these ecosystems. We need to find a way to engage in these discussions uh, on high seas conservation. And that was sort of how I got involved. And, and a lot of that happened before COVID, but then a lot of these discussions have also been happening during COVID as well, because all of those negotiations have been sort of put on hold. So really on the, I suppose, the lip of undiscovered, well, and of the unknown in terms of sea life. And I guess that's also kind of adds the imperative why we need to caution or protection when it comes to this region, because there's a lot we don't know about it. So yeah, yeah. it's this idea of the precautionary principle. So we really need to be careful when there's uncertainty, when we're sort of um, aware of our own ignorance about these systems. And these systems are challenging because this is um, in areas beyond national jurisdiction. So there's no one country that sort of sets the law. And as a consequence, you have 
the process of negotiation, which can take a really long time, even within one country, let alone, you know, many countries coming together to try to figure it out. But this area covers nearly half our planet. And so it's really thinking about this forgotten half of Earth's surface um, that isn't currently sort of under one clear umbrella for biodiversity protection. So before we um, kind of explore uh, biodiversity protection on a high seas but further, could we just step back and talk about what threats are facing marine life? Um, so like what kind of threats are there that we should be concerned about? Um, some of the things that we're worried about uh, on this half of the earth that we're more familiar with are also impacting high seas. So things like climate change, um, plastic pollutions, uh, and then there are some things that may be unique to the ocean. So overfishing, for example, um, of course, there's coastal um, fishing and overfishing within um, EEZs, but there's uh, a lot of high seas fishing. Um, and then when we think about things like uh, deep sea mining, which is an emerging industry. So a lot of the things that I'm kind of paying close attention to are things that are sort of emerging. They're kind of coming up. So one of the challenges um, that we're sort of, for me, facing with the high seas is the reality that for a long time, this area of the world was sort of protected by virtue of how far it was from shore. It was incredibly expensive and logistically difficult to operate an industry on the high seas. And it's getting easier and easier. And we are seeing emerging industries that maybe don't have analogs close to shore that don't have analogs on land that are going to uniquely impact the high seas. And so those are some of the challenges that we're really looking at um, addressing. And within the context of the BB and J, we have uh, an opportunity to sort of address that um, for particular activities that may be impacting basically all the biodiversity between the floor and the surface. Um, so deep sea mining, you know, falls under its own category, fishing falls under its own category, but for any organism that maybe doesn't directly fall into either of those categories, this is how we might um, protect it. So I think one of the key things when it comes to trying to protect um, the ocean and in particular high seas is being aware of how pollution or soil cell pollution might vary uh, with space. So you have um, things like deep sea mining, which might have more impact around the seabeds or um, how perhaps plastic might embed itself in the sediment um, compared to say at the ocean surface, while it might be more noise pollution or larger um, plastics or oils and stuff. One of the challenges that the high sea faces, this is true for any ocean system or, or really um, aquatic system, is that the you know, impact in one place is probably not gonna stay in that place. So when we think about conservation, there's almost like this implicit understanding that there is some geographic bound on an impact. And we really have to examine whether or not that's accurate for the high seas. And so this is true for plastic, this is true for oil, this is true for mining, this is true for fishing. You could be conducting some industry half a world away from where the impact is most acutely felt. And that really goes back to the life cycle of the organisms that are living in these areas, how widely distributed they are, the current systems, how far debris is carried. Um, it could take years to really see an impact from one area in another area. And so that creates a huge amount of challenge and uncertainty in thinking about managing these impacts. So yeah, the main challenge, or the key, one of the key challenges, I suppose, is there's a huge amount of variation, but it's dynamic and it's across multiple scales. Um, so quite a daunting challenge, really trying to find a way to make sure this kind of region is protected. Can you can you um, talk a bit more on kind of impacts you might expect on marine life, how um, animals are impacted by pollution? So there are so many different impacts that um, we could see. And one of the problems that we're facing, and I know that I'm sounding like a total broken record here, but 
it's just like ignorance, ignorance. We really don't know. It's hard as scientists yeah. to get out and study these systems too. But some of the impacts that you see on high seas life could be analogous to what you might see closer to shore. So for example, with plastic pollution, a huge impact and endangerment is entanglement. So a lot of people think about organisms eating plastic and certainly organisms do. We don't actually have our a really great handle on all the ways that that might impact organisms. So we know that there are instances where an organism will consume plastic, that plastic will block their digestive tract, um, and then they will um, suffer some sort of fatal consequence as a result of consuming that plastic. But we also know a lot of organisms may be eating plastic that are, are sick or starving for some other reason, in the same way that we see organisms eating things like floating pumice when they're starving. Um, and so there's a lot of nuanced interaction with that, especially because plastics may hold on to sort of more bioactive molecules that could have toxic effects on animals. There may be um, increased risk of exposure to toxicants from eating these plastics. But again, you know, we don't have uh, a lot of data. So that's certainly an active area of research. You know, with regard to jellyfish, a colleague of mine did a study looking at the impacts of plastic ingestion on jellyfish. And it turns out jellyfish can eat just anything. <laughs> <laughs> so they just eat it and they spit it out. Uh, but entanglement, I would say, is you know a huge issue. Lots of evidence of mortalities associated with entanglement. A lot of this comes back to ghost nets, these nets that um, are cut from ships for a variety of reasons and sort of left to float around the open ocean and and their net quality doesn't change just because they're no longer attached to a ship and so their organisms caught in these nets they die of course then that may attract other predatory or scavenger organisms which then come around these nets and then they might get entangled and die in layers and layers and layers of potential interaction um, of course oil has huge impacts that we're just beginning to really see for ocean surface life so I study life that actually floats on the ocean surface or swims very near the ocean surface. And you would think we would have a pretty good handle on how oil impacts organisms that live at the ocean surface. They're called Neuston. But in fact, you know, we don't have um, a particularly nuanced understanding of it. But it turns out even things like uh, oil dispersants might impact them, even potentially more than oil. And then when we think about things like deep sea mining, that's gonna be potentially releasing a huge sediment plume into the water column. And so that's the big concern that a lot of people in my field that study organisms that living, you know, that live somewhere between the seafloor and the surface are thinking about how far does a sediment plume go? How thick is it gonna be? This is the clearest water I've ever seen down in the deep sea. So what happens when it's suddenly filled with mud? So I think, one of the images that came into my mind when you were talking are these images of, say, whale carcasses with plastic nets in their stomachs or birds um, covered in oil on the beach or something like that. But what you're saying, it sounds like there could be a huge uh, variation of impacts. For example, if you use oil dispersants to deal with a oil um, pollution or oil spill on the surface, that might stop some seabirds from being contaminated, but it might have a worse effect on the Newston. Yeah, yeah. It, it's a complicated sort of juggling match to understand and appreciate it. And that is, you know, one of the big challenges. Okay, so this oil dispersant will allow us to sort of get rid of these big patches of oil. And, you know, for some organisms, that's really good. But for other things like sargassum, which is this floating yellow seaweed that makes up the bulk of the biomass in the Sargasso Sea, which is this shoreless sea between the US and sort of um, Europe, Africa, and the middle of the North Atlantic. And uh, if you look at the impact of dispersants on sargassum, it, uh, for whatever reason, they sink more in the presence of dispersants. So that's sort of like, oh no, <laughs> here we've got all this oil, the sargassum is trapping the oil, that's terrible because then little sea turtles and other life are sort of associated with sargassum because that's their natural habitat. So you wanna get the oil out of the sargassum. So then you dump a bunch of dispersants on the whole mess and then everything sinks to the seafloor. Maybe that is better than having oil associated with sargassum. I don't know. But there's a lot of cost benefits to assess and those kind of cost benefits will change all the time given how dynamic the system is as well. So. Yeah. yeah, extremely complex. Um, 
a slight aside, but when I was um, reading up on the current conservation efforts around high seas, um, there was a theme in some of the public comments I found, which um, were interesting and basically kind of basically they're asking is why is it that humans should care about this um one i haven't got a direct quote was very much but they basically called the ocean just empty space and suggested that actually it's empty space why can't we just use that for dumping plastic like a landfill or something um i mean i feel like you've already demonstrated it's quite a dynamic system it'll probably impact us in terms of lots of different ways like fishing etc but um how, how do you think this might impact humans if it does continue letting pollution in the, in the marine system continue? I mean, so first I just want to respond that like the empty space comment is something that I hear a lot. So that is a real challenge that as a science communicator, I'm, I'm really trying to get across. Like it's not empty space. Of course, I'm sitting here with, you know, a background that looks very empty. But a lot of the organisms we see are, are dark blue. They're living right below the surface. So I can tell you, I took this picture while I was collecting life at the ocean surface. So there is actually life in this picture. It's just camouflaged or right below the surface where we can't see it. So this idea that there's empty space out there that we can just jump, dump all of our trash um, is fundamentally wrong. Uh, but I really understand why people think that um, because it's it's like a world inverted. You know, we're we're used to looking at a picture like this on land and all the life is above. And in the ocean, we really need to flip it upside down in order to see where all the life is. Um, in terms of impacts of dumping trash on the high seas, one of the challenges is that there are probably a lot of impacts that we're not gonna see for a very long time. So one example is a colleague of mine at the Smithsonian who is looking at the presence of non-native species on trash floating across the Pacific. So in 2011, there was a huge tsunami in Japan. A ton of debris from Japan was carried out to sea. And we can actually use that debris um, to try to understand what the impact of sort of large scale plastic distribution might be like. And one of the things that we're seeing is even now, 10 years later, uh, plastic from the tsunami is washing up on US Canadian coasts and it's carrying non-native species that are from Japan that aren't local to our habitat. And these species could potentially colonize, they could disrupt local ecosystems, they could disrupt local uh, fisheries, local industry. We really don't know. And if you think about it, this is happening on an ocean-wide scale all around the world right now. Plastic persists in ways that natural debris does not. So woods, things like that, that float out to sea, driftwood, uh, that's eventually eaten up by organisms and sinks, right? Plastic can persist for years, potentially decades, uh, depending on the size of the plastic, carrying organisms across ocean basins. So it's not out there. It's, it's out there, but it's also much closer to home. And we will see very surprising impacts that I think um, probably won't necessarily anticipate or expect. So pollution or debris in the marine environment not only can transport um, invasive species across um, national borders and environments and ecosystems. But it sounds like pollution could also help other species to thrive as well as being negative to other species. So is it possible that um, our impact might also kind of shift as but I suppose what you could say is an ecological balance where some species might actually benefit from pollution to the other's detriment? Oh yeah, it's gonna change a lot, right? And so, and and then one thing I think that's true for a lot of humans and for human industry is that like change isn't always the thing that we want, right? Because, um, you know, our industries are sort of built on some uh, prediction of consistency over time, at least in the natural environment, right? And so you're not wrong. There are species that probably do benefit from the presence of plastic. One example is this little insect called a sea skater. And it's sort of very similar to the little pond skaters. You'll see the little spider looking guys that float on the surface of ponds and sort of zip around. 
So they're the only genus of insect that's made it onto the high seas. And these sea skaters lay their eggs on floating debris. So there's an increased number of sea skaters in areas with increased plastic. And scientists think it's probably because one of the limits to being a sea skater is it's really hard to find floating debris out on the ocean surface. And now there's more of it. So the only genus of insect that has made the high seas its home is now being helped by long-term ocean plastic. So perhaps in the long, very distant future, that might lead to a whole new range of species in the ocean. But I'd like that idea if that was the case. But also, I don't like the idea because that means there's plastic. Right, it's a really <laughs> weird PR move for these insects because yeah. it's like, ocean insects like hanging around your trash, you know, and you're sort of like, no, sweet little insects. Oh, you're so innocent. And now you're being associated with something that people really dislike. But, uh, but I mean, yeah, the, you know, the animals eat these insects too, right? Like these are tasty little snacks for a lot of organisms. And so they're increasing, other organisms might be increasing. I mean, one thing I'm seeing is that you know, our, our understanding of the surface ecosystem is actually way behind our understanding of plastic on the surface. So we know so much more about the distribution of plastic than we do about the distribution of surface life. And so there are uh, all these organisms that have been like eating tons of trash. And there's sort of this big question in the back of my mind, like why, why albatross? Like, why are you eating all this plastic, right? I mean, your lighters and like doll heads and things that, you know, don't look anything like a squid. Why are you consuming it and then feeding it to your chicks? Why turtles? And one thing we're seeing is that if you actually look at the composition of their diet and break it down based on where the organisms can be found, like right at the surface or in the pelagic zone or on the floor, uh, it turns out like up to 80% of their diet by volume may be surface life. 30% of their diet for some of these seabirds. And so now it's like, oh, you know, they're going after these things that float and are brightly colored. And for some surface life, things like little by the wind sailors, they feel like plastic. So it's like, you wouldn't even necessarily be cued into the fact that it's not prey from the texture. And, and that kind of changes things. So it's sort of like, yeah, the impact of plastic on open ocean organisms is going to impact different organisms differently. And it's also going to impact organisms based on ecosystem interactions. We're just sort of getting a hold up right now. So that um, kind of leads into that question of why is a high seas a big focus for conservation when it's really like we know more about the problem than the impacts of it. Um, we know there's animals out there like the Balela Valela, the by the wind sailors, or the um, um, for some reason I can only remember the Latin name, Glaucus Atlanticus. Oh, yeah, the, the blue sea dragons. The yes. sea dragons, yeah. We know they exist, but we don't necessarily know how the impact of this problem is. And yeah. so that I suppose gives motivation to try and um, influence the negotiations for the UNC Treaty. Well, you know, also, if I can be totally honest with you, like so many of the environmental challenges we're facing right now are sort of literally or figuratively, it's on fire. Like, what do we do? Right? Like, climate change is happening. It is launched. You know, our opportunity to sort of have intellectual discussions about intervening have passed, you know, 40 years ago, right? Now we're just dealing with the consequences and figuring out how do we mitigate it? How do we adapt to it? Um, gosh, and this is true for so many things that we sort of, in my generation, have interacted with. You know, we were like trying to recycle, and then that sort of didn't work out for at least plastic super well. So now we've got all this plastic everywhere, and we're just figuring out like, what do we do? How do we deal with this? And the high seas is like one of the only areas that I'm involved in, in terms of conservation and sustainability, where it's like, oh, we actually have the opportunity to sort of step in and build policy around conservation. And, you know, like I'm from Arizona, so the western half of the United States, which is just burning up right now, right? We're sort of past the point of having conversations about conservation. Like it has been impacted, you know, the ship has sailed, but this is one of those very hopeful areas where it's like, oh no, we might actually be able to 
conserve and protect some of these ecosystems, you know, before they're like totally impacted beyond recognition and we're sort of all grieving and trying to recover some of what we've lost. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. You need to strike um, whilst the iron is hot. Or I guess the better way is um, make sure there's no fire <laughs> yeah. without having to fight a fire. Yeah, exactly. Like let's yeah. make sure the forest is protected rather than thinking about we should have been protecting it before it's alive. Right. If to right. use the current uh, um, environmental traumas as a metaphor. Yeah. And, you know, one of my favorite analogies is um, thinking about Central Park. Like it would be impossible to set up Central Park now if you just like went to New York and you're like, you know what this city needs? Like a giant pristine park you know, that's like very well maintained and like very thoughtfully sort of curated so that, you know, people and nature can coexist in this really beautiful way. Like, no way, that would never happen, you know? But, you know, someone had the vision of Central Park at a point in time where it was still possible to develop it. You know, it's like the Grand Canyon right now. Do you know how many housing developments would be on the edge of the Grand Canyon if it wasn't a national park, right? I mean, everyone would want to live there. It's such an amazing place, but we've conserved it. We've protected it. We've set it aside for the benefit of future generations. And thank goodness we did. So now that we're kind of digging deeper into conservation and you mentioned that this is now the time where conservation is to be built into the high seas or how the global community approaches the high seas um is the high seas currently protected at the moment is there some kind of there is a, so there's a patchwork of protections um for you know specific organisms or habitats but you know less than one percent of the high seas is fully protected so you know effectively not really at least not from my perspective as someone who doesn't study sort of large charismatic or economically important organisms, at least not at the moment, right? <laughs> We're thinking about sort of biodiversity in the same way we might think about the Amazon rainforest. Is it easy to point to any particular species in the Amazon and say, well, like, why should I care, right? No, I mean, you could point to a species in the Amazon that hasn't even been described. But then if you look at the Amazon as a whole, you're like, okay, yeah, this is super duper important to like global function. The biodiversity in the Amazon is a really important resource for current and future generations. And we're sort of burning a lot of it down right now. <laughs> and that's, that's a challenge. So there is a little tiny bit of protection, but it would be sort of the equivalent of, you know, protecting like the big cats in the Amazon at the expense of the trees and the insects. So really, um focusing on the things that have almost immediate value to us as humans but not necessarily having a big picture of the conservation of the ocean i would say yeah immediate value or, or maybe immediate engagement yeah 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 um so you mentioned this pat patchwork of um protections um does that mean just there's lots of little parts of the ocean that are protected and a lot of it isn't? Or do you also mean that perhaps there's some nations have protected, protected some areas and some have others and potentially a clash in terms of who manages what? Yeah, there's a little bit of, so what I mean by patchwork is sort of thinking about policy very broadly. There are certain areas where there is clear policy sort of in place um, and, and a sort of clear um, central uh, or centralized sort of um, community sort of for managing that. So um, for example, deep sea mining, um, there is already some um, policy set in place for sort of regulating and managing deep sea mining on an international scale. Um, you know, is it necessarily biodiversity sort of focused and conservation focused? You know, but there is at least some policy we can point to and say like, okay, this is how this resource at the moment is being managed. The same is true for fisheries. But then when we think about, um, so for example, mesopelagic fisheries, fisheries that are, you know, super deep down, you know, who are those exactly? Who's the regulatory body that needs to be consult? I'm not, yeah, it's a little bit unclear. And, you know, that sort of lack of clarity really propagates out to the vast majority of area on the high seas. So the uncertainty of policy, it, it's not only per 
the area or where it is, where, where, where it's protected, but also what's been done. You say there's like new and emerging industries or, or taking advantage of this more and more accessible environment. Um, and some of those industries might be more regulated than others, basically. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yeah. absolutely. And I mean, a lot of them are very new. And so there's a big question about like, well, what do we even need to regulate, right? Like what, what do we need to know from an environmental perspective in order to generate um, policy that really protects our collective interests as you know, a human species that is reliant on these ecosystems in some form or another? So if there's um, a treaty being built at the moment that could potentially have conservation at its center and, there's, uh, and the current um, policy and regulation around conservation is very patchwork, it seems there's a hole there which could be filled with, for example, private enterprise um, or people trying to uh, take this into their own hands at all of a conservation efforts by private companies, but might be trying to clean up the ocean or anything. Oh, interesting. So right now you're sort of wondering, are there, yeah, yeah, there are. So um, there are, gosh, a variety of different initiatives at various stages of development um, that are trying, trying to tackle this sort of high seas ocean plastics issues, one example. Um, so uh, a couple would be the ocean cleanup that is trying to go out and collect plastic in a semi-autonomous way. So without monitoring um, their impact necessarily. Um, of course, they're launching a prototype this summer and they will be out and they will be sort of looking at the environmental impact. It's unclear what their predicted impact will be. So the current setup is they've got two giant ships and then they've got a big net stretching between the ships and they're just gonna drive these ships around with the net in between and try to net all the plastic and life that is at the surface. Uh, it's really, really difficult to sort out the two. Uh, I've been pretty concerned about this effort for a while. I, I know they've done an environmental impact assessment on their latest design. I can infer from the comments they've made on their environmental impact assessment that it suggests they will potentially have a significant impact on some life at the ocean surface, but they haven't publicly released it. So I don't actually know what it says. So I think part of that is there's kind of like almost seems like interaction between two of the points made previously about it. It's a incredibly dynamic system of potential risk trade-offs, such as you said previously, between the sargassum and birds getting covered in oil. Um, but also um, a lot of this lack of regulation means that if people do see these problems and, and people are very passionate about trying to solve them, mm -hmm there's still a lack of regulation. Nonetheless, that means private enterprises looking to clean up the ocean might still, um, well, these efforts might still suffer from a lack of uh, international policy or regulation. So it kind of impacts both potential polluting um, industries, but also people who might just want to go out there and clean up the ocean themselves. Yeah, I mean, it, it cuts both ways. And so for the ocean cleanup, I know they have a unique agreement now with the Netherlands to try to kind of uh, cross the bridge between the United Nations and uh, their particular high seas activities, but we're all stakeholders in the open ocean. And one of the problems with this idea that it's just a bunch of trash out there that whales occasionally swim through is that you end up developing cleanup technologies that may actually be worse than the plastic itself. So imagine you know, a, a desert with no life in it and there's some plastic, you know, and occasionally like an antelope or something wanders through. And so you can, you know, envision a bulldozer just coming through to collect all the plastic as if there's nothing there, but it's not a desert out there. It's more like a meadow. And so if you're going to collect all the plastic, you know, in this very coarse bulldozy kind of way, then you're going to end up collecting all the life that the organisms you're concerned about depend on. So it's sort of one of these, like, does this even make sense from what we know about the ocean surface ecosystem? But then let's be real, what we know about the ocean surface ecosystem is very limited. So what do you do in the meantime? You just kind of hope that you won't mess it up and keep going or do you, do you pause? Yeah, from, and from what you said previously, um, it might sound like that some species uh, 
might have a preference for environments with a high plastic density as well. So there's mm -hmm. the ocean gyres, the garbage patches. Yeah. Um, is it, are there species that are potentially um, invulnerable because they prefer to live in these denser environments? So we're still not super clear on the ecosystem of the North Pacific garbage patch, but the North Atlantic garbage patch is the Sargasso Sea. So you don't hear it referred to as a garbage patch as much because we already had a really good understanding of the ecosystem before the plastics issue started to arise. Uh, the problem is we don't have that understanding for any of the other garbage patches, right? And in fact, I hate the term garbage patch. I'm not picking on you, of course. I use it because it's a way to discuss uh, these areas of the ocean, these you know convergent zones of the ocean. But still, compared to closer to shore, I mean, there's still some of the cleanest places on Earth, right? They, there's a lot of plastic in the garbage patch relative to other parts of the ocean, uh, but they're still compared to like coastal zones, for example. I mean, we're looking at a fraction of a percent of, of total ocean plastic. So this picture behind me was taken in the North Atlantic garbage patch in the Sargasso Sea. And I mean, hello, you know, it's, it looks pretty clean. So even the idea that this is how we tackle the issue is that we go to the farthest place from shore where plastic has been found and collect it there. When even by the ocean cleanups own studies, we know that up to 98% of plastic that enters the ocean ends up back at the coast. Most of those nasty pictures of the garbage patch that you'll see if you Google the North Pacific garbage, you know, are actually from coastal zones. You can click on the pictures and see like little islands in the background. There are no islands in the Pacific garbage patch, right? So even though we, you know, call it a garbage patch and think about it as this like gross floating island of trash, it's mostly like these very small little flecks of plastic. And then there are ghost nets that are out there and they're not necessarily super easy to find. So uh, another organization that's working on sort of cleaning up the patches, focusing more specifically on ghost nets. And they're having people tag those ghost nets with satellite trackers. And then they're going and picking them up by hand, which really reduces the environmental impact. Um, so I'm gonna wrap up this uh, section soon and move on to the Q&A and the questions that have uh, been sent. Um, but firstly, there's a couple of questions left I have for you. And the first one is, so what is the goal then of the um, current negotiations at the UN? We've got a patchwork of um, conserved areas in our managed areas in the ocean already. What's the end goal from trying to get involved in the UN? So uh, the, the end goal, I think, uh, is something that is still very much up for grabs, right? So probably every everybody that's involved in this process has a unique set of goals that they're hoping to see move forward. And maybe there's some agreement and there's probably, you know, some disagreement that needs to be sort of hammered out. For me, you know, we're really wanting three things. The first is we want some sort of mechanism for setting aside marine protected areas beyond national jurisdiction. So think about the Grand Canyon or Yosemite or other amazing natural areas of the world, wonders of the world. Uh, at the moment, if those wonders fall beyond the jurisdiction of one nation, then there's really no set way to sort of collectively come together, humanity together and say, you know, this is special. This is worth protecting, you know, and we're all going to agree that even though, yes, the fish in this area may be delicious, and yes, the minerals in this area may be valuable, that it's worth more as a whole than it is for the sum of its parts, and we're going to protect it using a mechanism like a marine protected area. So that's one thing we want, is a way to say this is valuable for humanity, for the environment, we want to conserve it. <laughs> The second thing we want is a better mechanism in place that's transparent so that everybody, even if you're not part of the United Nations, can be involved for really understanding and evaluating and studying potential impacts, right? So, you know, it does seem far away, but, it, you know, there's a very real possibility that high seas industries will at some point impact your life. And so isn't it important if these things may impact your life, that you at least have the possibility to understand the potential impacts of those industries on the ecosystem. 
uh, and be engaged in the discussions. So we want environmental impact evaluations, continuous monitoring, continuous science, and we want all that to be very transparent. And part of that transparency means having sort of a central place in governing body that's informed by science, that is open, that people can be a part of and can at a minimum sort of watch in the same way that, you know, here in the US, it's like you can get your little ticket and you can go sit in on the Supreme Court and you can go sit in on Congress, right? Because it's important that it's for the people, by the people, and the same we believe should be true for the high seas. Sure. So basically, it needs to be transparent. It needs to be um, as efficient monitoring and it needs to be interconnected as well. Mm -hmm. um, exactly. So rather than the patchwork of areas, it's an interconnected system with uh, multiple vices be able to put input on it. Yeah, in, in a very sort of centralized way. So you really know, OK, where do I go if I want to know what the latest information on this issue is? Um, that's sort of our hope. There are lots of other things folded into the treaty, genetic resources, things like that. But our sort of hope is, is to sort of push forward these you know, known, tested, and, you know, like scientifically informed mechanisms for conserving biodiversity. Yeah. Sure. So you, you mentioned uh, we, um, if there's people watching this who want to perhaps get involved in um, what you're doing um, and who with in terms of um, helping push the uh, idea for better high seas conservation, how can they get involved or where can they go to find out more? Myself and a group of other scientists, 19 incredibly brilliant people, is very lucky to work with, uh, published a letter in Science Magazine calling for protection of the high seas, um, specifically asking for these sort of three wants and hopes. And so we have now available um, for signature the letter up on our website, which you can find right here. So you can go to protect the high seas. Uh, dot marine slash conservation dot org. Um, you can actually also just go to protect the high seas dot com and that'll direct you to the same place. Add your name to the list. A lot of this work is a little bit like a duck, you know, floating at the surface. It doesn't look like anything is happening and you're furiously paddling underneath. And so right now we're very much in sort of like duck phase. Of a lot of work is happening behind the scenes and we hope that very soon uh, we can sort of begin to engage signatories in some of the efforts that we're making right now. So if you're interested, if you want to get involved, I mean, and this is a, a signatory page that's open for everybody. So we really believe, of course, we want science, we want scientifically informed policy, but this isn't just a science policy thing. This is like, hello, all of us on this planet have a vested interest in this issue. So if you care about it, sign, and we're going to keep you up to date on the things that we're doing and on ways you can help. Sure. Um... So one last thing for me before I ask a few audience questions, um, and that is, if, is there a key message uh, you would like people to take away from this conversation regarding ocean conservation or pollution on the ocean at all? Man, what a great question. And like, of course, I'm so busy nerding out about the details. You know, I think for me, it's, it's more of an emotional message of, of, you know, we have an opportunity to do something here that hasn't been done in a century or more. This is a really hopeful, exciting, forward-thinking time. And being part of this process, I've sort of watched my thinking shift from like 50 years to 100 years to like, okay, 500 years to what do we want this to look like in a thousand years, right? And, and this is the very beginning of this process. So, you know, if you've ever wanted to be involved in something that has the potential to impact generations in a very positive way that is being formed and developed right now, this is it, it covers half our planet. You know, join us, get involved. Uh, it's a really exciting time to be alive. Great, <laughs> thank you. Um, so uh, I'm gonna, go to a final section, which is just a few audience questions that have been sent in. Um, the first one is what can the average person do to help? Uh, you've already mentioned um, to sign up to uh, your letter, so um, people can find out that way. I suppose, are there any uh, direct actions people can do to help with either conservation or marine pollution? So I really 
of depends on your personality, right? Because I think that for me, this is sort of how I, I engage and help is, you know, I see a problem that I'm like, oh, I'm going to go nerd about it for like two or three years, and put together something like very, very specific and then publish it and then, you know, move forward on that level. That's kind of how I do things. But gosh, you know, if you like to be outspoken and go protest, I would say one thing is to really be on brands, you know? So I think recycling our plastic, reducing our plastic use, it's really important. It does matter. There are individual things that we can do that turn into collective things, but it doesn't make sense if we're not letting brands know, right? So for example, if you're not buying Coke products anymore because of their plastic uh, issues, right? They're one of the number one sort of plastic polluters from a consumer plastic source perspective, right? So if you're abstaining from that, like make that clear, you know, go on social media and say so and at them if, you know, if you're the kind of person that's like, this is how I want to show up and do the work. Um, if you're someone more like me where I'm like, mm, I'm shy, but I, you know, I don't use Coke products and I, you know, I'm working on the science behind the scenes, get involved with us. Um, I would also say that a lot of this change has the potential to happen at the community level. So as ironic as this sounds, I think it, it sort of comes back to the fact that we're living this very dispersed life. And so, you know, right now in the context of my community, thinking about what are we doing about our waste? What are we doing about, you know, the surplus now of masks and PPE and things like that um, and getting involved on that level. I would also say like, we know nothing about the ocean surface ecosystem. So if you have any interest in studying these topics, like the, it is a wide open field. So if you're a PhD student, if you're you know an undergrad and you're like, man, I wanna be involved, what can I do? We have way more data and questions than we have people to work on them. So um, come join us. Uh, and we've also got actually on that front and trying to understand the ocean surface, a new NASA funded citizen science program to understand how and where ocean surface life is distributed. So kind of tackling this question of like, how do we know where all the garbage patches are, but not where all the surface ecosystems are? So if you like to go walk at the beach or sail or surf, or you know maybe just go to the beach once a year, um, join our new uh, community science project. So it's gocscience.org. Uh, it's a really fun community monitoring program. We have monthly sort of group meetings with the public. Um, we even have fellowships available for community members that maybe aren't scientists, but are just like really, really into going to the beach and telling us what they see. And that's all you have to do. You go to the beach, you let us know what you see there. It's like so fun and easy. So, and we're your excuse. So quite a lot you can get involved in terms of um, research, perhaps through like a research project as an undergrad or a postgraduate, um, to get behind on water policy oriented areas by getting involved in uh, the project you're working with. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps more direct action, either through pressuring the government or companies uh, alongside consumer choices. Uh, but also get involved in community uh, groups as well. But you could always just start with a, a beach cleanup or something, right? Yeah, yeah you know, it's funny because like beach cleanups do not make the news a lot, right? But they are like so effective in terms of the amount of trash that's been picked up around the world. Like beach cleanups are it. I mean, people that run beach cleanups are heroes for sure. So that's a great way to get involved. <laughs> um. So uh, you mentioned monitoring, and I've got, I've got a question related to that, um, is can we uh, monitor the impact of pollution well at all? Um, and I think for me that kind of relates back to what we discussed regarding, um, for example, whales versus jellyfish. I mean, I assume you can tag a whale, but can you tag a jellyfish to yeah. see how that impact is? So you can tag jellyfish, although the field is, is still being developed. But, you know, one of the challenges broadly with monitoring is like, OK, and sorry, my cat has been really good this whole time. And now she's decided that she's going to she's going to sing for us. So if that's coming through, apologies. But anyway, um, you know, with the high seas, we don't really have like a ton of before data, you know. So when we're thinking like coastal, not only is there before data that's actual data that scientists have gone out and collected or that has been collected through, um, you know, maybe non-traditional mechanisms, like looking at fisheries catch, right? How big were the fish that they caught hundred years ago versus today? And you can use that to kind of infer, you know, what, what was that population of fish like hundred years ago versus today? 
we don't really have a ton of data like that. And so one of the things we need to monitor impact is some semblance of before data, which is what we're trying to do right now, right? So go out there, just try to understand these ecosystems on a baseline level so that then if when these impacts really ratchet up, whether it's an oil spill, whether it's more classic, whether it's you know the continuing impacts of climate change, at least now we're paying attention and we can say, okay, these things have changed. They've changed in this direction. There's a strong correlation. Let's design a study to try to figure out if it's a cause. Excellent. Um, so we probably should wrap up soon. We're quickly running out of time. Um, unfortunately, we're able to get through all your audience questions. Uh, I have time for one more though, uh, which is on jellyfish. And it's just asking, are we expecting a jellyfish boom in the future then? That's a tricky question because it really depends on where you are. So maybe uh, jellyfish blooming is a totally natural part of their life cycle. So this is something that they do every year in the same way that flowers bloom every year, right? So come spring, it's flower season, it's poly se pollen season, it's jellyfish season. Um, different species of jellyfish bloom at different times of year, but blooms in itself, they're not really surprising. And in fact, a lot of species depend on these blooms. So we know that for example, leatherback turtles will follow jellyfish blooms kind of around and just sort of munch within the bloom um, as jellyfish season advances. I think what the person might be asking is like, are jellyfish gonna get worse over time? And that was something that scientists were concerned about for a little bit because it did appear that in coastal regions that were heavily impacted by people, you know, there were more jellyfish and less fish and other things. It turns out that a lot of those are actually coming from um, more local drivers. So there are areas of the world where we're seeing huge increases in jellyfish, but those areas don't necessarily have the same cause in common. And so trying to untangle what's the cause for my ocean backyard and how do we address it? So for example, in, in my relative backyard uh, near Chesapeake Bay, there are you know, more stinging nettles than there were a couple decades ago. But part of that at least is because people have been building these great boat docks uh, off their beautiful you know, sort of canal houses. And those boat docks happen to be favorite habitat for young jellyfish larvae. So whoops, right? <laughs> now we know. And that's a local problem that you know is going to require a local solution to address it. And that seems to be the case for a lot of jellyfish blooms that we're seeing getting worse. Whether there's sort of a global movement, I you know I haven't seen any evidence to suggest that's really played out. Yeah. Yeah, because I think what I've seen regarding uh, jellyfish blooms or the future, um, what all the reports I've seen, it seem to suggest that in the future, we're going to have a hot ocean with just jellyfish and we're going to have to eat and survive off jellyfish in some kind of marine water world Mad Max scenario. Um, but actually, a lot of it is just down to local changes and probably goes back to what we said, well, what you said earlier, where there's, it's a very dynamic system with high variation geographically and through time um, and a lot of unknowns as well. So local but possibly not some huge worldwide white worldwide trend <laughs> well and one amazing thing that we didn't know before this question was being asked that we have a much better handle on now is that it turns out like everything eats jellyfish we didn't realize that because when something eats a jellyfish it's like immediately gone so if you're a scientist doing gut content analysis you're not going to see the jellyfish in the stomach of a predator right because it's just water and it's already been digested it was like five minutes process. But now scientists have actually gone out and gone like, oh my gosh, like all these fish eat jellyfish, all these turtles eat jellyfish. So even if jellyfish do temporarily bloom, one of the consequences might actually be they feed a lot of marine life and sort of potentially that can be a kind of reset too. So, you know, initially it was like, oh my gosh, is it just going to be slime and who even eats these guys and jellyfish burgers and super gross. And now it's like, oh no, 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 no. They're a really important part of the ecosystem too. So if um, all these animals are eating jellyfish, maybe we shouldn't be too scared of a jellyfish burger ourselves either. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> in fact, you know, I mean, there are places in the world where jellyfish are a super important part of the menu. I've eaten jellyfish many different ways, uh, salads, fried and cupcakes. They're not too bad.
<laughs> something to try uh, when I'm next looking for inspiration in the kitchen, maybe. Maybe. Um, right, we need to wrap up. We've run out of time. So I'd like to say thank you to our guest, Rebecca, to sing through all my questions and also to the audience for attending and giving their questions. So with that, I'll wrap up uh, the webinar. So thank you very much for attending. Thank you so much, Simon. It's been amazing to be here and wonderful to talk to you today. <laughs> Lovely to see you too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.